Their number three lasted 72 hours, <laughs> and their number four is supposed to be longer acting than that, and it's only last 24. That's if I don't play with it. Yeah, I'd take it back. <laughs> And I have to take my pulse at night, so I wear it in the day and night I have to check, so that's not long enough. Well, before I forget, I meant to do it this morning and I got so wrapped up in what I was doing. Next Sunday is time change. You are going to lose an hour of sleep. I loved what I said a few years ago. I read on a business, if you're grouchy, irritable, or in a mood, there'll be a $10 charge for putting up with you. <laughs> I kept saying that, and finally a member of the church walked up and said, as long as you don't expect to collect, we'll get along great, boy. And I said, that's even better than I came up with. So next idea is time change. Um, Fortunately for us, we don't have to worry about time, the moving the clocks, everything we pretty well have is automatically adjusted. So, uh, and I get up too early anyway <laughs> to worry about that. Take your soul books, please, and turn to 874. There are sometimes I would love to have the problem of not being able to get up, but I, I'm thankful for the way it is now. 874. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me. Still I can trust and feel no 
He says that term may sound too sugary or saccharine for some, but those who preach can appreciate it. Almost every preacher will have his corn, but every preacher needs his Philippi. That delightful sweetheart church whom he has in his heart and loves with all his heart. And that, folks, was what the church of Philippi was all about to Paul. Because what we learn from chapter 1 is God's purpose. And that's what you need to put on your sheet that I gave you tonight. God's purpose. God's purpose was this, was to get us into a position, get us into life that says, in chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I am in a straight, I am in a difficult place. I do not know what I want to do. What I want to do is I want very much to go on and be with the Lord. I don't know of anybody that doesn't belong to the Lord, doesn't want to go on and be with the Lord. But he said, but for you it is necessary that I study. <coughs> And if we do the figuring right, math right, he's only got about seven years left of his life to live. He doesn't know that at the time, but we have the hindsight of it. So God's purpose for the brethren is that we get in a position where God's purpose will be fulfilled. And he says some incredible things. I, I, I remember you. I, I love you. I remember every member of my prayer for you. And now... We come to God's pattern. And specifically, we're going to look at the first 11 verses tonight. But you can look throughout the rest of chapter 2 to figure out God's purpose. In fact, chapter 1, you go back to, or chapter 2, I'm sorry, you go back to Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was more concerned that the brethren were concerned about his sickness than, they, than he was about his own sickness. Because what is this all about? This isn't about whether somebody calls me on the phone and says, well, how are you doing? I mean, that's nice when they do. This is not about somebody sending a card. That's nice when they do. This is not about somebody just showing concern. That's true. But what Epaphroditus was more concerned about was the stopping of the gospel. That's the theme of chapter 2 in God's pattern here. So, he starts off by saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in whom? Christ Jesus. Now, I pray frequently about the situation in the Ukraine. But folks, we've moved into a new era. We have brethren over there in the Ukraine that are suffering. We have several congregations of the Lord's Church that are in the Ukraine, especially after the Soviet Union collapsed. The, that was the one place the church thrived. For me personally, I think this is Satan's way of using Vladimir Putin to destroy, try to destroy the church. He knows it isn't going to work, but that's me personally. But when you look at the news... When you look at what, what they're showing, I, I give you an example. I, I was looking at, again, the nine cameras that the Ukrainian government has across their country. It was about midnight when I was looking at it. That was the most peaceful town, that's the most peaceful country I've seen. There was, a, there was traffic moving, but there wasn't much traffic. I said the craziest town to drive in is Houston, Texas. From 3.15 to 3.30 is about the only time you ever see no traffic in Houston. And Houston's got, in the metro, six million people. And yet, people were driving. There were people out walking. I know, you, I know what you're thinking. I was like this, like you. They're walking at midnight, <laughs> but okay, they do things differently. And yet I keep seeing on the news this getting pounded and this getting bombarded and, then, and this is heightened and this is heightened and then Putin is now crazy and, he, and he's got a screw loose and, and he's reminding you of Hitler and, and, and you just sit back going like, I know what I'm told, 
But what do I see? What do I see? And so I'm not telling you whether or not you should believe or, or not believe or whatever. I'm not trying to give you your conclusions. What I'm trying to get at is this mind that's in Christ better be in our minds. Literally, the Greek is mind up. It is just like my mother and dad used to tell me, you better mind. You better mind. I don't hear that much anymore, but you better mind. Think like Jesus thinks. Think like Jesus thinks. Luke 6, 35, the preacher in Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, Dan Rouse reminded me, he says, lend and expect nothing in return. Dan says, I want to tell you, I've been preaching for 50 years, he said, and I don't remember anybody yelling at me the way that brother did. And he went on for 10 minutes, he said, that is absolutely ludicrous. You cannot expect me to believe that Jesus taught that you're going to lend and expect nothing in return. And he said he went on for 10 minutes and got to the end of it and he said, I don't know what to tell you, brother. He said, don't yell at me. I'm not the one that said it. Jesus said it. <laughs> Jesus said it. Think like Jesus thinks. We talked about the 10 lepers this morning. I, I used to be told you know what? I wouldn't go near them because they got leprosy of some type. I wouldn't go near them with a 10-foot pole. And one guy made a joke. He said, I wouldn't go near them with, with Phil. And I went, who's Phil? He said, the ten, my 10-foot ten pole. <laughs> but what did Jesus do? When they came, they're still standing afar off. But what does he do? He sees them. See, they're sinners. You don't have anything to do with sinners. That's not what Jesus did. Former preacher in Silver City. He was confessing one time there's a man and I see him from time to time at the university. He's got long hair. He's got a cowboy hat. He's dirty most of the time. He has a dog with him. And if you saw him, your first impression is he's just a bum. When you finally get to doing a little homework about him, he speaks three languages. He served in the military for years. And if you talk to him, he's one of the nicest guys you ever can meet. Now, he gets a little cranky about wanting his way, granted. But he's not who he, and, and, and the preacher said, I was walking down Bullard Street, and here he comes up, and guess what I did? I went down the other side of the street. He said, halfway down the street, I went, are you just that stupid? What would Jesus have done? Jesus would have walked up there and said, well, hello there, my name's Jesus, who are you? Think like Jesus thinks. Because the Bible talks about humility. Look at verse 1. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. King James says of the same mind. Having the same love, being of one accord. That's not a Honda. You do know the first car in the Bible was Honda because they were in one accord. Oh, never mind. Of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each build another up. That's what the word esteem means. We talk about people with low self-esteem. Dr. Dan Dozier said on the Amazing Grace Bible class, he said, isn't it amazing that we know the facts? No, I'm sorry, Joe B. Isn't it, a fact, isn't it amazing that we know the facts, but emotionally we don't believe them? I'm chosen. I'm loved. I'm adopted. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. Ephesians chapter 1. We don't believe any of that. 
Because when we come down toward the end of our life, we start questioning, did I do enough? Did I say enough? Did I do the things that God was well pleased with? Look at verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. Let me tell you what the church has done historically. They ignored the first part of chapter 2, verse 4. You're not supposed to look out for your own interest. You're supposed to look out for the interest of everybody else. And if you look out for the interest of, ever, of, of your own self, you're sinning. Paul would argue with you. Paul would argue with you. Yes, we're to esteem each other. We're to build each other up. But we cannot afford to not look out for our own interest. In fact, if we don't look out for our own interest, who will? I know this is a crude illustration, but one of my favorite is from Walker, Texas Ranger. When this girl got shot, and she didn't want to do any of the treatments, she didn't want to do any of the therapy to start walking. Because God was going to help her. God was going to miraculously come in her room and he was going to heal her. Until Chuck Norris walked in and he said, well, I have a little story to tell you. And she said, what? He says, you know, I've never won the lottery. And she says, why? He says, because I've never played it. You can't win if you don't play it. Now, I'm not advocating you go out and play the lottery, but the point is people get people understand what you mean when you talk about money terms. You cannot, God does not expect us not to look out for our own interests, but he doesn't expect us to only look out for our own interests. Because we need to be a people of self-denial. Luke 9, 23 to 27. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If I took 100 Christians in a Bible study and asked them a survey and said, what's the first thing you have to do? What is the first thing Jesus said you have to do to follow him? I would venture, I guess, I'd get 90% of this answer. Take up the cross. Daily. You can't, and I can't take up the cross daily if I won't, first of all, deny myself. Now, let me ask you a question. Does Satan know what will irritate you? I got irritated when I walked out of the house tonight. One of those things that irritates me is, is that when somebody asks me to do something, and they'll turn around and they won't even say thank you. Will you hand me that? Will you hand me that? And then I get treated the same way. <laughs> and it's real simple what I'm asking for. It's real simple what they are asking for. But Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you got to first of all deny yourself. Take up the cross daily and follow me. What will a man gain if he gains the whole entire world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? Because see, what Jesus wants is unity. Now, I know John 17, 20 is Jesus' valedictory address, or part of it. And I know what he's asking. But since we're so disunited in the religious world, what Jesus really meant was is that if you have it doesn't matter where you go to church it doesn't matter what you believe it doesn't matter what you say it doesn't matter to him as long as you just attach the name Jesus God church Holy Spirit on it as long as you tag it it's okay with him really what happened back in the, with King Uzziah in about 2 Kings 13 what did he do you remember what he did? He tried to become a priest. 
He tried to go into the temple. To the temple. And what did God do? God struck him with leprosy. And he never got to serve out the rest of his term. He was officially king. But about 15 years, he never got to serve as king. Why? Because he, denied, he wouldn't deny himself and he wasn't united. The Bible says, look, if you want unity, you got to look out not only for your own interest, but for the interest of others. The NIV has this closer to the Greek. And it says, who being in the very nature of God, didn't consider equality of God something to be grasped for personal gain or to be used for his own advantage. Do you remember how many times, at least once, that they tried to make Jesus a king? Remember he had healed people? And, and people were so infatuated with him. And Jesus took the title, didn't he? He went and, and he took the title as king and said, I will be your king, right? Wrong. What did he do? He ran. He ran. Because that's not his heavenly father's plan. That was never his heavenly father's plan. His heavenly father's plan, first of all, was that he was Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23, God with us. And it is such a hard concept for us to wrap our heads around that Jesus was God in the flesh. Because we have a general term for God. The Hebrew and Greek have more terms for God. Before Abraham was, I am. You remember that big big thing that they tried to, tried to uh, uh, kill Jesus about? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. They said, you're not even yet 50 years old. How can you say before Abraham was, I am? Because he is. He is. And he's got all authority and all power. He's got all authority and all power. But folks, it wasn't something he stole. It wasn't something... That he said one day, Father, give it to me. God gave it to me. And then he gave the great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and along with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, we need to have in our minds the theme of the Bible. The theme of the Bible, you know this. Somebody's coming. He did. Spent about 33 years on this earth. Now I'm talking about in physical form. Someone's here. John said in John 21 that if we could contain the scrolls written, they would have written them. But Jesus in three years, about three years, did so many things that the scroll, the world couldn't contain all the scrolls written. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus is coming again. Now, I know you get tired of hearing me say it, and I don't care. The reason I don't care is that they're still telling you that Jesus is coming to set up a kingdom. I heard, a, I heard a prominent preacher this morning said, Jesus is not sitting on the throne of David yet. If you'd have wrote, walked by my house this morning, I'd have said, you're full of baloney. He's already on the throne. He's already king of kings. He's already lord of lords. He's of the lineage of David. In fact, isn't that what Peter brought up in Acts chapter 2 whenever the birth of the church And if half the things happen that we've been told, I'm going to be honest with you, I wouldn't look forward to the judgment day. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. i got to wait 1,000 years to go to heaven. 
I got to wait 1,000 years after God has killed all the bad, I mean, after Satan and, and the bad people have killed each other. We're going to have a utopian society up in Sinclair where everything's going to be perfect. God's going to recreate the fig trees of the world. We're going to live off the fig trees of the world for a thousand years. I don't like figs that much. And I got to wait 1,000 years. My wife's going to die, or I'm going to die in that, and then we're going to marry and give it in marriage, and I still got to wait a thousand years before I go to heaven? That ain't much, is it? Pardon my bad English. When the Bible says the judgment day, every eye will see him. Sentences will be handed out, will be changed in what? The twinkling of an eye. I don't know how all that works. I just know that's pretty quick. We're not going to have these old bodies anymore, thank God. We're going to have new bodies. What do they look like? I have no clue. Someone is coming again. And so we need to have this mind of humility. Are we going to be called upon to die for the cause of Christ? Maybe. Because see, Jesus made sure that when he died, he died more horribly than anybody else in the history of mankind. What do you mean by that? There were other people that were crucified. There were two with him. Yes, but they deserved it. He didn't. He humbled himself to the point where he was willing to be hung for six hours one Friday, to be humiliated the whole entire night before. How'd you like to be spit upon? How'd you like to have your clothes torn? How'd you like to have a crown of thorns? Platted, as the King James says, and put on your head. And how would you like to look at that crowd who's taunting you, who's humiliating you, and all you could say is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You see, Jesus became human. I'm like. Brother Ed Stegall, who preaches for the Jackson Street Congregation now in Monroe, Louisiana, but he's preaching for the Woodland Oaks. And he said, I used to believe that there were several ways God could save us. That God could have taken the time to choose something else. He said, I don't believe that anymore. The reason is, is because there's only one way God could save us. The first thing is, he had to become like a human being. He had to become a human being. Ahaz is told by, Jer by God through the prophet Isaiah, choose a sign. Ahaz refuses to choose the sign. And God gets angry with him because he won't, he won't choose. And he said, here's the sign. Now what's coming is, is that the one, the promised one will come through the virgin. And he will become human. And he'll suffer just like we do. And eventually, Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 53, he will suffer. He won't be given a chance to give his side of the story because he won't talk. When he's humiliated, he won't humiliate in return. And yet when Peter took that sword, cut Malthus's ear off to stop the whole thing. Jesus says, don't stop this. This has to happen. Restored Malthus's ear. And then, what did Satan do? He made sure that the prophecy was, built, was fulfilled about these 12 men. They all abandoned him. Not even, not slowly. How long did it take them? One night. He became human because he emptied himself. Imagine you live 
in the perfect, perfect place. You don't have to worry about a gas bill, an electric bill. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to freeze to death or whether you got to put a nail in it, as Dubs used to say. Every, it seemed like every day I had to put a nail in my house. It never decays. It never goes away. It never, and it's an inheritance. You didn't earn it, but he's going to give it to you. And Jesus left all that. And he came to the imperfect place. Where there's earthquakes, where there's tornadoes, where there's cold, where there's hot. Well, from one day to the next, you don't know whether you're going to live or not. Now, do you get the idea of he emptied himself? Because what he did is he humbled himself. He humbled himself. You recall James chapter 4, first 10 verses? He tells us 10 things within that. And he ends it by saying, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And what? He'll lift you up. I was watching one of my favorite old television series on Cozy TV, Emergency. It reminded me of what happened on our senior trip. In 1985. But this this lady was in a panic. She was in a panic and she just could not let the paramedics help her. And of course, you know, the old shows, take it easy, take it easy. I always want to tell them, well, you get in this much pain, let's see if you take it easy, okay? <laughs> I digress. And they kept saying, take it easy, take it easy. Jesus humbled himself because he lived what he prayed. I decided in my senior year that I was going to go to Western Oklahoma State College and get an associate's degree in psychology and I'm going to figure out why people behave the way they do. Yeah, I'm laughing about it too. I cherish the degree because it gave me a basis because there's nothing that has taught me human behavior better than this book. Nothing. But go back to Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46 for a couple of minutes. Here's Jesus. And he's sorrowful. How much is he sorrowful? To the point of what? Death. He sweated. He didn't sweat drops of blood. But there is a medical condition that when you're that anxious, when you're that in distress, that you will sweat blood. But he sweated like blood. I had a friend of ours that, because of his wife's medical condition, things coming up on him, he just was under so much stress that he, he literally broke out broke out in the biggest rash I've ever seen in my life. And he said it hurt. And he goes to Dr. Adi Zaga who helped him out a bunch. But Dr. Adi Zaga says, I can't help you completely. What you have to do is you have to calm down. You're going to have to do some of this on your own. And he asked us to help him and we did. And, and the next thing you know, the medicine did help. But finally the anxiety came down. That's Jesus. And what does he do? You've got three men with him who don't even know what's going on. We don't blame them. Please don't blame these three men. They've had a long day. They've worked anywhere between 8 and 12 hours. Somebody asked me the other day, so would you like to stay after school or you want to go home? I said, I want to go home. And the reason? Dealing with kids is a challenge today. And so he's prayed this prayer. Oh, my father, 
if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And what are the three disciples doing? They're sleeping. He goes and he says, couldn't you watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. He goes back and prays a second time. Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he looked over there and the three men that he just asked to watch with him, their eyes were heavy. And so he goes and prays. Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that third time he prayed, he got up and he said, Rise, let us be going, my betrayer is at hand. Now, here's why I brought up the point of psychology. Jesus became a nutcase, didn't he? No. You want to know the power of prayer? Just look at that story right there. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. See, Jesus was still human, but he obeyed his father. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 said, Though he was a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. And Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says, It's appointed for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Praise be to God. You see, God rewarded his son. God rewarded his son... And he'll reward us if we have the same mind Jesus did. Now, what are you talking about? Look at who exalted. And when God does an exaltation, God does an exaltation. I mean, what did he say again? He's going to change our bodies. My, one of my favorite passages is Romans 7, 23 to 25. Who's going to save me from this wretched body of death? So with the law I serve, or with the mind I serve the law, but with the spirit I serve Christ. But he reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast and movable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And God gave him an exalted name. You and I don't think too much names. Now, for me personally, I do think my name. You see, my cousin, my dad's cousin, got my mom and dad together. And he got his left side blown off in Vietnam. My dad's name was Kenneth. My first name is Kenneth. And I've had people try to tell me, and my family has, has given me permission if I want to. Why don't you call yourself KD? Why don't you call yourself Kenneth? No, there's only one man named Kenneth. I'm proud to go by the name that gave his life for our country and got my mom and dad together because I wouldn't be here. Because God will be victorious. God's always going to win. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Because you see, God will be glorified. It breaks my heart today that Satan has deceived so many people. That's his job, I know. That's his goal, I know. But how many people have you talked to, and I'm not asking you to verbalize it, but you'll know what I'm talking about, who will say something like this. You invite them to church, you invite them to study the Bible, you talk to them about their soul, and they'll tell you, Oh, I don't believe in, in God. A 
And they'll, they'll tell you they don't believe in God. And they're proud of it. They're nice about it. They're not rude. But they don't know what to say when you respond. You will. No, you didn't hear me. I don't believe in God. No, you didn't hear me. You will. But I fear for you it will be too late. Philip S. Tedley wrote a song, and I'm trying to find it again. And if it wasn't him, someone else wrote it, but I thought it was Philip S. Tedley. And it goes something like this. Too late, too late will be the cry. Too late, too late when you die. Is it going to be too late for you? Paul loved this church. Paul loved the Philippian church. When he wanted to write to that sweetheart church, he wanted to make sure that what would not get in them is a spirit of laziness. When we get to chapter four, or chapter three and four, you'll see what I'm talking about. Beware of the dogs. Beware of those who only serve God as their belly. Beware, beware, beware. We live in a society, we live in a country where we have warnings everywhere. I mean, there, there's warnings everywhere. And since we have so many of them, we don't pay any attention to a lot of them. Bill Ingvall has made millions of dollars off one phrase. Here's your son. Do you know that when Sears made a hair dryer and Sears would put on their hair dryer, do not use in the shower. He said, now when's the last time you were in the shower washing your hair and you grabbed that blow dryer and put it in the shower with you? We kind of laugh about that, and it's true. But we get so immune to warnings, we don't even pay any attention. I don't know what that lady in Santa Fe is going to do. And I don't know how that trial is going to, I don't know how that's all going to end up. But a, but a police officer, 43-year-old Santa Fe police officer and a retired Las Vegas firefighter lost their life the other day. The woman made up the story she was being kidnapped. She ran from her apartment and went down and told someone and come to find out she made the whole story up. Two people lost their lives in a wrong way driving on I-25. How many people are we going to have to lose before we finally get the idea that the design of the highway is to go one way? How many spiritually are we going to have to lose until we realize that there's only one way to get to heaven. And that's by Jesus Christ. There's a fountain free. There's a fountain free if anybody wants to use it tonight and reuse it. If we can serve you in some way, let us do it while we sing. There's a fountain free, it is for you and me. Let us haste away to its bring. Tis the fountain of love from the source above. And he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis the fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life now it flows. While the waters roll at the weary soul, hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, tis the fountain open for all. There's a living well and its waters swell from the eternal life they 
they can give. And with joyful sing every spring, O oh spring, as we haste to drink and to live. Oh, will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis the fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me and this stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis the fountain open for all. 330. 330. We give those who were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning an opportunity to do so. We're going to sing this to help prepare all our hearts and minds for it. On this Lord's Day we assemble round the table of the Lord. Happy hearts are made to tremble when we hear His blessed word. Thanks to God for such a Savior, now enthroned in heaven above. Thanks for this exalted favor, bless the memorial of His love. There in agony He suffered on the cross for you and me. Now Thank you, Father, that, as Paul told us, as often as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Father, we know that he's coming. And we praise you that you have designed a day in which all wrongs will be righted, accounts will be done, taken care of, that we can stand before you prepared to go home. But none of that's possible, Father, without the institution of the Lord's Supper and the act that gave it the credibility. When he hung on that cross for six hours one Friday, what a mangled mess his body was, but how you've transformed it into that glorified body that no refiner can ever ever make that way. Bless the ones partaking tonight, Father. We bless us all. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.
Father, we continue thanks for what's in the cup. Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. Satan has tried to get us to understand that the cup is more important than what's in it. But we know what Jesus said. If you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And he wasn't trying to get us to be cannibals. But what he was trying to do is get us to remember it's all about him and what he's done for us. Bless the ones partaking tonight, Father, but bless us all. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Patrick, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son. Father, open our eyes so that we may see what you want us to see. Help us to be in your word every day because that's what opens our eyes, Father. Without your word, Father, we'd all be lost. Father, thank you for your son that he died on a, on a Friday, I believe, Father, on, on a cross that he took willingly, Father, for our sin. so many things to be thankful for, yet we, we take them for granted, Father. Help us to realize, help us to be a thankful people, not a grumbling people. Help us to understand the blessings that you've given us. Father, thank you for our little church. Thank you for all oh, so many things. Thank you for the family you brought me into. And Father, again, thank you for your son. Almighty oh, goodness, Father, thank you for your son. It's in his name, Jesus.